Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Carrot. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Parasaurolophus as well as some dinosaur news. First in the news, there's a new oviraptorid dinosaur discovered, and it was published in Scientific Reports on Nature.com. The title of the paper is A New Oviraptorid Dinosaur, parentheses, Dinosauria oviraptorosauria, from the late Cretaceous of South China and has paleobiogeographical implications. It was published by Junshang Lu and others. So it's yet another oviraptorid dinosaur that was discovered in the Ganzhou area of China. This one's called Huan Anosaurus Ganzhou Ensis. So Huanan means southern China, and Ganzhou is the nearby city that it's named after. It was discovered during construction of a railway station. And those are kind of two things I'm starting to think about when I think of China as dinosaurs and trains everywhere. <laughs> it's believed to be from the late Cretaceous and about 72 million years ago, and it's characterized by a bony crest on the top to the back of its head. So it really looks a lot like Oviraptor, but it has a smaller crest. There are also quite a few other differences in the skull when you compare it to other oviraptorids, but most of them aren't that obvious, at least to me, unless I'm really scrutinizing the skull, so I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but we'll post a link to the article if you really want to see all the scientific post-orbital differences and all these little minute changes in the skull. They discovered a nearly complete skull, several vertebrae, a complete hand, and some partial leg and arm bones, so they have a pretty good idea of what it looked like. And there is a really good artist rendering on Scinews.com that we'll also have a link to. The nearest relative to this dinosaur is called Sidipati, which was discovered in Mongolia. And that leads scientists to believe that they had quite a large range since this one was discovered in southern China and was about 3,000 kilometers or 1,800 miles away. The authors of the paper also talked about how this area in China is becoming a hotbed for dinosaur discoveries, especially for oviraptors, so it'll be interesting to see if there are other new discoveries coming out of that area. The Smithsonian Magazine published an interesting piece on the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry. So for a long time, the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry in Utah has been a big murder mystery spot. The quarry is 148 million years old and has a bunch of Jurassic dinosaur fossils, 75% of which are of Allosaurus, at least of the ones that have been found so far. And for years, scientists have wondered what happened here that made so many Allosauruses die in that spot. And theories have included it being a predator trap, so maybe a Stegosaurus got stuck in quicksand and the scent attracted predators, and then they also got stuck and the scent attracted more predators and so on or a severe drought, or bodies floating and bloating and coming in from other areas. So now paleontologist Joseph Peterson and his team are reconstructing what happened. And in the Smithsonian, they reported that they've been cleaning up and removing limestone the last four years so they can map the fossil bed in detail using photogrammetry, which is 3D photographic maps. And they're also experimenting on bird carcasses to see what happens, quote, when they're soaked in the type of ancient environment that Cleveland Lloyd represents. So what they're finding so far is that there may have been a toxic water source for the quarry, but there's still a lot to find and learn. So just this summer, the team found a new part of the quarry to excavate, and it has evidence of a 48th Allosaurus, so it'll be interesting to see what else they find out. Next in the news, there's an article titled The Five Most Gruesome Dinosaur Injuries Ever Discovered, which is published in Forbes by Shana Montaneri who keeps popping up in our research with some really good articles. This one highlights a few things. The first one is a nearly complete Allosaurus specimen with a lot of trauma to one side of its body that may have resulted from an infection or congenital abnormalities. And there was so much extensive damage in that side of the Allosaurus that it was in the whole range of ribs, vertebrae, toes, hips, and arm bones. So all over one side of the body. It looks like quite an injury. They also looked at an amputated sauropod tail that was discovered in 2013 where there is a damaged vertebrae that shows signs of regrowth after it was damaged, indicating that the dinosaur survived the trauma 
and likely lived with an amputated tail for at least a while. The scientists who discovered this feature believe it's possible as it happens fairly frequently with crocodiles that have somewhat similar tails. Yeah, that sure would be unpleasant though. And I was kind of wondering about the balance because I knew they used their tail a little bit for balance. but they use it for defense too. Yeah, that's probably how it got injured, I guess. Poor sauropod. <laughs> yeah. There was also a discovery of Majungasaurus with teeth marks in its bones from another Majungasaurus. That indicates the first evidence of non-avian dinosaur cannibalism. So apparently the Majungasaurus teeth characteristics were unique in that time and place. So the marks that were made in the other Majungasaurus are quite likely from cannibalism. And then they also found those teeth marks in other animals, so it looks like it was just attacking everything. <laughs> There's also another discovery of a series of lesions on different Triceratops frills where they took a good amount of damage while they were using their frills for defense. Based on the markings, they believe that most of these injuries came from other members of the same species while in sort of competition combat, and certain types of ceratopsians were more likely to get in this combative behavior than others, the ones that are similar to triceratops, not the other type that has the one horn down the nose, the one with the two above the eyes, are more aggressive, I guess, from their data at least. And finally, they have some evidence showing that synraptors may have bitten each other on the head, and they discovered that by finding tooth strikes they call them, on one another's head that appear to be from the same size teeth that they had and at the right angle to be kind of chomping at each other. And they found about 25 partially healed bite wounds, so obviously that happened while they were alive and not getting chewed on afterwards. That's pretty nasty. There may be a lot more different types of dinosaurs to discover than previously thought. Gwyn Guildford on Quartz wrote a piece called we're not even close to discovering all the dinosaur types that existed, and we've discussed this before, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about her article. So according to Gwyn, in 2006, scientists estimated that there were 1,844 discoverable dinosaur genera, and that if we keep finding about 15 new dinosaurs per year, about half would be discovered by 2037. But since 2006, new dinosaurs have been found at a faster rate, and in 2006, 527 genera were named, but now we've grown to around 800. So this means that there may be more dinosaurs than previously estimated, and one professor estimates that it could be as many as 3,400 types of dinosaurs. So this is my favorite news story, <laughs> because it led me down a rabbit hole of the Australian outback, which was really fascinating. So there's a new museum that's sort of scheduled to open. It doesn't really have a firm date yet but it's called the Iromanga Natural History Museum. And the description on their website is, quote, The Iromanga Natural History Museum is an educational and tourism development committed to discovering, conserving, and showcasing the fossil, natural, and cultural heritage from the prehistoric and modern-day environments of the Upper Murray, Darling, and Lake Eyre slash Cooper Basins. As a premier tourism attraction, it will dedicate itself to celebrating the prehistoric history and the amazing diversity of life of outback Australia. From the tiniest fossils, the size of a sugar grain, to the mightiest dinosaurs Australia has ever seen. End quote. Which is a pretty fun description for a museum, I think. Looking at where it's situated, it reminds me of the Wyoming Dinosaur Center that we talked about. And that one's located in Thermopolis, Wyoming, which has 3,000 people. And I mentioned it's in a tiny town in the middle of nowhere. But this is a much smaller town and even more in the middle of nowhere, if you know anything about the Australian outback. So a little bit about Iromanga. It's known for its oil and its opal deposits, and it has a population of about 400 people. And according to the website, it's, quote, just a few hours flight or a two-day drive from capital cities. The museum is located close to four state boundaries, making it easily accessible by interstate and international visitors. So I wouldn't describe a two-day drive as easily accessible. And if you look at it on a map, it is, what, I think 20 hours from Sydney, and it's basically just straight out into the middle of nowhere. They say, quote, regular flights arrive at Quilpai twice a week. And from there, it's an easy one-hour drive to Iromanga on excellent sealed road. 
which I don't know. I just think that's hilarious. I guess it's not a dirt road, so that's worth something. And there are 40 beds of accommodation in the Euro Manga, as well as a cafe, motel, caravan park, swimming pools, police station, state school, oil refinery, community hall, park, and the Living History Center. So quite a bit to do there. <laughs> But, all kidding aside, it does look like a really awesome museum. And it's on this thing called the Natural Science Loop Road, which is in the southern outback of Queensland. It looks like, I couldn't find an exact measurement, but I was trying to measure it on their map, about a 1,000 kilometer or 600 mile loop that goes through some significant areas for astronomy, bird watching, dinosaurs, geology, and Australian history. And it just kind of hits a lot of these little towns throughout the Australian outback. That sounds like one of the coolest road trips you could do. But back to the museum. The highlight of the museum is going to be a dinosaur that they're calling Cooper. It hasn't been formally named yet, although they believe it's the largest dinosaur ever discovered in Australia, and likely a titanosaur. We're expecting a publication detailing its discovery and classification early next year, and they're hoping to open the museum in late 2016. And they have a massive 1.67 square kilometer piece of land picked out for the museum. So it should be awesome. And it makes me really want to go to Australia. <laughs> and keeping with our theme the last few episodes talking about Legos, Lego fan Sammy Mustanen created a microscale Lego Jurassic Park. Lego has a platform that allows people to propose new Lego sets, and people can give feedback, share ideas, as well as support the proposals. If a proposal gets 10,000 supporters, that means it will be reviewed by Lego, and it may then become a new Lego set. If Lego selects it to become a new set, the proposer receives royalties on sale, so that's pretty cool. Sammy's Jurassic Park features miniature versions of the Visitor Center, the Raptors Pit, the Entrance Gates, and more, and so far the set has 1,626 supporters, including me, and 536 days left to reach the 10,000 supporter mark, and we'll post a link on our blog if you want to check it out. Oh, also about Legos, we've been talking a bunch about the Lego Jurassic World video game, and we just unlocked the Apatosaurus. And Sabrina had mentioned that she really wanted a baby Brachiosaurus, and that's basically the way that they have the Apatosaurus. For some reason, it's like a tenth the size of the Brachiosaurus, and it runs around a lot faster. And I think Sabrina spent about 15 minutes just running around in circles enjoying <laughs> the baby Apatosaurus. So. It's pretty fun. Yeah. All right, and last in the news, thank you to Phil from Facebook for sharing this link on our wall. An engineer in Portland, Oregon, created a Sue the T-Rex bike that he's selling for $2,000 on Craigslist. And I'm just going to read the ad because I really enjoyed the full ad. It says, Presenting your chance to be the proud owner of the only dinosaur skeleton that has been reanimated through the mysteries of science and technology. She is a beautiful, fossilized, juvenile Tyrannosaurus Rex who now consents for me to harness and ride her in parades and other special events. She's a bit difficult to handle, but she's never attacked anyone in the crowds that form whenever I take her out of the warehouse where she lives, unlike her cousin from Jurassic Park. I've labored for many months on this act of creation, but now find that I'm not the right writer for this beautiful creature. This wonderful, rideable dinosaur, this fulfillment of my childhood dreams, needs to go to someone who likes being the center of attention, likes making the news whenever they're out in public, and likes inspiring joy and wonder in the faces of children. I'm just a quiet engineer and bicycle fabricator and am not interested in celebrity. Specs. 12 feet long from head to tail, 5.5 feet wide stance, 8.5 feet tall, size of a 12-year-old young adult T-Rex, 90 pounds recumbent tricycle made from chromoly steel, foam, and textured paint, 200-pound rider weight limit, 9-speed wide-range drivetrain with a top speed of about 15 miles per hour, comfortable cruising speed of about 7 miles per hour, Seat is about five feet off the ground, so use a step ladder, or if you have good balance, use foot and handholds hidden along the left side of her body. Head is a marionette that turns side to side and opens her jaw, controlled by wire from handlebars. Arms are attached to pedals and can be controlled in combination with head to create believable performances. Sue can answer questions, wave at audience, snap her jaws in excitement, disgust, hunger, etc. Disassembles using basic tools into multiple pieces to fit within a pickup truck bed for easier transport to events. Caveats. Sue requires frequent touch-ups to her paint and foam. There are always bits of the sculpture rubbing against one another because she is a moving kinetic sculpture. I will include a bucket of textured paint with her. 
Sue has handling quirks because of the geometry tricks and illusions I had to pull to make a vehicle that seemed to have the proportions of a real dinosaur. She is not a daily driver dinosaur, but is perfect for parades or the playa. She has good brakes and is stable enough if you know her limits. I'd be happy to offer dino riding lessons to prospective buyers. Please don't call just for joy rides. In the pictures, it looks really fun to ride. Uh, the wheels look a little bit kind of like, how is it balancing? But... And it does have the tail getting pretty close to the ground like Barney, but that's to hide the chain that goes down to the back wheel. Yeah, so if you're in Portland, Oregon, and have 2000 bucks to spare, and you like getting attention, and you like dinosaurs, then you should check out this ad. There's probably about three people that meet that description. <laughs> Maybe. If we were in Portland, Oregon. $2,000? I don't know. For a bike you can't really ride. Well... <laughs> I'd at least take a look at it. <laughs> no Joey Riding. And that's it for the news. Now our dinosaur of the day is Parasaurolophus, requested via Twitter from at Darth Citrus, so thank you. Parasaurolophus means near-crested lizard. It lived in North America in the Cretaceous, and fossils have been found in Alberta, Canada, as well as New Mexico and Utah. Fossils were first found in 1920, but it wasn't first described until 1922 by William Parks, and this was based on a partial skeleton and skull that was found in Alberta. It's named after Sir Byron Edmund Walker, the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Royal Ontario Museum, and it has an estimated length of 31 feet or 9.5 meters, it weighed about 2.5 tons, and the skull was about 5 feet or 1.6 meters long. Parasaurolophus could be both bipedal and quadrupedal. It probably ran on two legs, but walked on all fours when eating. It's thought to be closely related to Saurolophus because they have a similar-ish crest, but it's now thought to be an offshoot of Lambiosaurines, which we talked a little bit about the differences of these subfamilies in episode 31, Corythosaurus. But just to reiterate, there's a couple of subfamilies. So Parasaurolophus is part of the Hadrosaurid family, and there's a few subfamilies. There's Saurolophus which had no crests or solid crests, and there were lambiosaurines, which had hollow crests, like Parasaurolophus. Originally, Parasaurolophus was thought to be similar to Saurolophus because of it had a crest, but again, the crests are a little bit different. There's three species of Parasaurolophus. There's Parasaurolophus walkeri, which is the type species, Parasaurolophus tubicin, and Parasaurolophus curtocrystastis, which has a short crest. So Parasaurolophus walkeri has a straight crest and simple tubes, which, as we talked about in Corythosaurus, these hadrosaurs had this kind of tube structure. Parasaurolophus tubicin had a long crest with complex tubes, and Parasaurolophus curtocrystastis had the smallest, most curved crest. So again, the first species found was Parasaurolophus walkeri, which is why it's the type species. One specimen of Parasaurolophus walkeri may have had a disease, and this is based on a V-shaped gap in the vertebrae near the base of the neck, though another interpretation is there may have been a skin flap or ligament that supported the head or the fossils could have been damaged through preparation. Charles H. Sternberg found a partial skull in 1921 in the Kirtland Formation in New Mexico, and he sent that up to Uppsala, Sweden, and Carl Weiman described the second species, naming it Parasaurolophus tubicin, and the name tubicin comes from the Latin word for trumpeter. In 1995, a second nearly complete Parasaurolophus tubicin skull was found in New Mexico, and Parasaurolophus tubicin existed slightly later than Curtocrystastis in New Mexico, and it lived among Ornithischians, Saurischians, Pterosaurs, Turtles, and Fish. In 1961, John Ostrom described the third species, Parasaurolophus curtocrystastis, based on a partial skull with a short crest and most of a skeleton. The name comes from the Latin word curtis, which means shortened, and crystastis, which means crested. New Mexico at the time of Parasaurolophus curtocrystastis was swampy and close to the Cretaceous Interior Seaway. Parasaurolophus curtocrystastis probably lived among Pentaceratops sternbergi, a ceratopsian, and Pachycephalosaur stegocerus nova mexicanum. Parasaurolophus curtocrystasis is the smallest of the species, and Parasaurolophus tubicin is the largest. In 2014, the journal PLOS One published a study by Xing about another possible species called Parasaurolophus giaensis. It was originally Caranosaurus 
Giaensis and was founded in China. Charonosaurus was named after Charon, is the boater in Greek mythology who rode the deceased across the underworld. Dinosaurs in the late Cretaceous in North America were very similar to dinosaurs in Eurasia, and Charonosaurus was slightly larger than other Parasaurolophus, about 40 feet long, weighing 6 tons, compared to 30 feet and 4 tons. But because of their similarities, that's why it was considered another possible species of Parasaurolophus. Parasaurolophus had a hollow crest with tubes that ran from each nostril to the end of the crest, and again, the most complex tubes were in Parasaurolophus tubicin and the simpler crests were in Parasaurolophus walkeri. Until the 1960s, scientists thought that hadrosaurs, again the family of Parasaurolophus, were amphibious, and they thought the crest may have helped them stay underwater. Now they think that it was more likely used for temperature regulation or making low-frequency sounds to alert others, and Vyman suggested in 1931 when describing Parasaurolophus tubicin that the crest's internal structure was similar to a swan, and also a hadrosaurid inner ears are similar to crocodiles, so they may have been sensitive to high frequencies. Parasaurolophuses may have been. There have been a bunch of theories about what the crest was used for in the past. Scientists, for example, used to think the crest was used to either support the head or neck, keep water out of its lungs back when they thought that it was amphibious, used as a snorkel, used as a weapon, used as a branch guard, but it probably ate <laughs> low-lying plants, stored salt glands, which is found in marine animals but doesn't explain the difference in the crests of the three Parasaurolophus species, and gave it a greater sense of smell. But then P.E. Wheeler proposed thermoregulation in 1978. And thermal regulation is when the surface area of the crest took in heat during the day and dissipated at night. A juvenile Parasaurolophus was found in 2013. It was only one years old, and it was 8.2 feet or 2.5 meters. In 2009, 17-year-old Kevin Terrace went with paleontologist Andrew Fark on a fossil hunt, and he found Joe, which is the name of the baby Parasaurolophus, which is also the best-preserved specimen. This Parasaurolophus started growing its crest when it was 25% adult size, which is sooner than Corythosaurus, which may be why Parasaurolophus crests are bigger than Corythosaurus. And it shows that Parasaurolophus also grew fast. Parasaurolophus Joe's skull crest had a little bump, so that shows, again, how drastically the shape of the crest changes throughout a Parasaurolophus's life. And Joe is named after Joe Augustine, who's the family who sponsored the skeleton's preparation. If you want, you can see Joe on display at the Raymond M. Alf Museum of Paleontology or go to dinosaurjoe.org just to see a virtual museum about Joe. In the 1990s, some American paleontologists and computer scientists scanned a Parasaurolophus skull and simulated the sounds that it probably made. Parasaurolophus sounds probably changed after puberty. Younger ones probably could hear and emit higher frequency sounds. And Parasaurolophus was a herd animal. It probably migrated from shorelines to higher grounds to reproduce. It had pebbly textured skin, and we know this because pebble scale prints were found on one Parasaurolophus skeleton, and it had a narrow beak, so it was probably pretty choosy about what it ate. It continually replaced its teeth, like a lot of other dinosaurs, and it had hundreds of teeth and a beak to crop plants. It lived in a warm climate, warmer than Alberta's climate today. There was no frost, and there were wetter and drier seasons, and it lived around lots of conifers, as well as ferns and angiosperms. Like Corythosaurus, Parasaurolophus had no natural defenses. It was probably prey to Albertosaurus, Gorgosaurus, and Dasplatosaurus. They were easier to hunt than a Ceratopsian, which had horns. Other predators may have been Trudon, especially to smaller, younger Parasaurolophuses. But Parasaurolophus could run on two legs. Actually, Hadrosaurs were the largest land animals that could run on two legs. Other dinosaurs in North America in the same time as Parasaurolophus included Albertosaurus, Nanotyrannus, Lambiosaurus, and Pachyrhinosaurus. Parasaurolophus can be seen in the media. It's actually in Jurassic Park movies 1, 2, and 3. as short appearances, either drinking from a lake or in a field captured by InGen. The Parasaurolophus in Jurassic Park 2 was nicknamed Elvis because of its pompadour-like horn, and the character Rowan Tembo also didn't bother learning dinosaurs' names. Interestingly, Jack Horner, who was one of the consultants, paleontologist consultants for Jurassic Park, said that the actors of Jurassic Park had a really hard time pronouncing Parasaurolophus. You can also see a version of Parasaurolophus in Star Trek Voyager. They were humanoid aliens called Voths, descended from Parasaurolophus, but they fled the galaxy before dinosaurs went extinct. And Parasaurolophus was also Ducky in Land Before Time, the cute little mm. yep 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 dinosaur. It was a Parasaurolophus? Mm-hmm. Huh. I thought it was like a Hadrosaurus or something. Well, 
type of hadrosaur. I guess so. Yeah. So again, Parasaurolophus is part of the hadrosaurid family, which is known for the crests on their heads. They may be used to help recognize individuals or make sounds or regulate the body temperature. And we also talked a little bit more about hadrosaurs in episode 31, Corythosaurus. So you can go back to that one and learn a little bit more about their family. And our fun fact of the day, still sticking to the egg theme for some reason, came up when I was researching the oviraptors in China. Within an area of about 40 square kilometers, more than 200 oviraptorosaurian nests with eggs have been discovered in the Ganzhou region of China. It's a lot of eggs. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. If you subscribe to our mailing list, you should have received free copies of the ebooks you requested, at least the top 10 dinosaurs of 2014 and what happened to Brontosaurus. And again, Dinosaur Wars um, should be out in a few weeks. So thank you for your patience. If you received the books and had a chance to read them, we would really appreciate reviews, but no pressure if not. Anyway, thanks for listening, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at I know Dino.